Are we all clear? <laughs> hey, it's Romania Black, and um, wow, I was um, I was quite passionate last episode. <laughs> I was really um, really emotional about my views on Kyoko, and I. I've not read the comments yet for uh, episode eight. <laughs> I've, uh, I've not read the comments yet for episode eight. I want to go ahead and record this episode because I just couldn't wait. I was like, I want to see exactly what happens uh, in this episode. But I, I definitely understand that there's probably some people that are like, wow, you were really, really, really passionate in how you did not like Kyoko. And yes, I, I was telling uh, some people in the Discord that I've, you know what, I've seen people... I've grown up in, like, I've grown up seeing people in toxic relationships, and I've just watched psychological manipulation happen with people, and I've had to sit there and just watch it happen, and you try to tell that friend, be like, hey, you know, from an outside perspective, maybe you shouldn't be with that person because they're really toxic and emotionally manipulating you, and, and nine times out of ten, they stay with them way longer than they should have, and some people never leave those types of relationships, which sucks, but... I feel like if you've ever, like, watched a friend go through a relationship like that or you've been in a toxic relationship like that, it's hard at the time to let that person go or you have a connection with them and it's hard to, like, move forward past them or you're trying to be a nice person. Ray is definitely the type of character... Ray is the perfect prey for a toxic manipulator because Ray is kind and nice and doesn't want to rock the boat. And they are afraid that, you know, if they make Kyoko mad, what will she do? And so it kind of makes you even more mad at Kyoko because it's like, clearly she knows that and she's using it to her advantage. And I don't know, I feel like the people that don't get upset about Kyoko are, they just either have not experienced that type of person in their own lives or they are that type of person. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> But yeah, so I was really, really passionate about the person. Now, because we don't have comments, I'm going to go ahead and say this. I am fully aware that this show will maybe present things about her character that will come to light later on that will alter my perception of her. That has happened in shows. I started out some shows hating characters. I was reading a book for a year and a half and half of that book, I did not like this one character. And about the halfway point, they started to do some things that I was like, okay, they're changing as a character. We're knowing more about them. My opinions of them are changing. So I know it will be very tempting in the comments to write, Romania, you don't know that this character actually has a growth arc coming up and you'll find out about the tragic backstory and all these things that'll make you completely change your opinion. I don't want to know that because I'm going to find out in the show. The show is going to let me know that. And if it doesn't let me know that, then that's fine. But also, when you're watching a fictional show, there are going to be times where people you watch don't agree with you. So if you love Kyoko as a character and I end up never liking her, that's just part of fiction. We all have different characters we like and don't like. It's okay. But I will tell you right now, I'm a Taurus. Full-blown Taurus. Birthday coming up. But I, I don't buy into the astrological stuff too much. But there is one thing. I am stubborn as hell. And if people try to make me change my opinion about a character, I will 100% do the opposite. <laughs> so I've had some characters in, in shows where people have tried to make me like them. They're like, oh, well, you just, you just don't know yet. You'll see. And what happens is the exact opposite. Not only do I not like them, I hate them even harder. So the best thing you can do if you like Kyoko's character is just don't bother me about it. <laughs> don't, don't try to sway my opinion. Don't try to come at me in the comments or in the Discord being like, well, what you don't know about her, just let it be. Keep those thoughts to yourself. And as things come to light, we'll, we'll traverse and go through it. Now, if y'all want to talk amongst yourselves in the comments or in the Discord and, and black box that and talk about her character and, and get into lively discussions about that, that's fine. Um, I just don't want to be influenced in my viewing. I feel like for me to interact with y'all, I want to genuinely interact with the series as if I'm watching it for the first time and all that jazz. But you already know that. So I just, I have a feeling that I'm not going to be able to read a lot of comments from episode eight because I have a feeling that my moderator is going to be like, nope, we're going to stay away from those. So if you don't, if I don't get to read your comment and you just get a heart from me and nothing more, then just know it's because I don't want to get into a big thing about Kyoko right now. That's all. That's all. We'll, we'll cross-reference her later. And I'm sure she's going to keep showing up throughout this damn series because Ray's entire conflict is hingent upon his relationship with her and her dad and her brother. So... 
She's going to be here to stay for a while, I'm sure. But man, it has been a long time since I've had a visceral reaction to somebody like I've had to Kyoko. And I just want to be like, bye and chuck them out, right? But a lot of times series like these want to have the care. Here's the thing. I, I, I do think I've watched a couple shows now where it's all about like continuing on and reforging that relationship and just like, like bearing with them and maybe they'll change and all this. I would like a series to be like, you know what? That person's toxic. How about you never talk to them again and go on and live your life and become a better person without them? I don't think. And you know what? I say that's not hard, but again, Ray can't exactly do that because his entire conflict involves her. So Ray is not like most people in the real world that do have the option to ignore and stay away from toxic people, but Ray doesn't have that opportunity, which makes me want to protect him even more. I want to just like grab Ray, hug him and be like, it's going to be okay. You don't need her. She's bad for you. I want Nikaido to give her a piece of his mind, but you know what? Nikaido's a freaking saint. So he probably wouldn't. He would probably be taking the high road and Nikaido would be like, oh, well, what a nice person you are, Kyoko. It's so great that you want to be here for Ray and support him. I want Nikaido to kill her with kindness. That's what I want him to do. I want him to slay her with his kind, perfect soul. That's what I want. <laughs> I'm not asking for much. <laughs> so. But I've talked enough. But yes, my feelings about Kyoko are strong. They're probably going to be strong. So just bear with me and I'll learn as the series gives me more information. And I try to keep an open mind. But man, there were a lot of red flags and situations that... I've been in and I've watched friends be in that rubbed me the wrong way. And I was like, mm -mm, no, no, we've, I've learned my lesson from that. And they've learned their lesson from that. We don't deal with that shit. So what can we do? But in any case, we're going to get started with episode nine as Ray possibly goes and tackles a match that could determine whether he plays Shogi again or not. <laughs> no big deal, but we're going to do that here in three, two, one. And let's just see how this all turns out. Oh, the tea tastes so good. It tastes so good. Oh, that, that validation that not only Ray calling her to be like, bitch, she ain't retiring. Your words need me nothing. Your attack on my psyche did nothing. Screw you. But not only did he do that, he just like hung up on her. He was like, I just came to tell you that bitch. Bye. Hung up. Oh, mm. Mm, I love our boy Ray being empowered. I love him helping that man. I love him saying, screw you. It's not an either or situation. It's not black and white. It's not like a shogi board. Life isn't like that. So, so, so good. <laughs> That was such a satisfying ending, and I know the show's gonna make me pay for it later. They're gonna be like, remember how you had a great ending there? Remember how that was very satisfying? They're gonna make me suffer later, but you know what? For now, for now, I'm fine with it. For now, I will, for now, I will deal. I will be happy. I'm, I'm set. You know what? For now, we're all good. We're all good. But yeah, I just, I... <sighs> I'm assuming the people that like Kyoko, they they know her evolution of a character. And it's almost, I know that people are going to complain. They're like, it's not a spoiler to say that we like her character. Um, and maybe you like villainous characters. Maybe you like toxic characters. Maybe you are, maybe you are into the plain Janes <laughs> of the world. And that's fine. Um, I, I get a little wary sometimes when people try to go into like a psychological depth of a character that I've known for two episodes. Because I'm like, well, let's wait a minute and see if I actually, you know, get to know the character and see what the show gives me and then afterwards we can talk about it but I just right now like I said in the reaction I've watched several shows that have had toxic characters I think of two in particular that I really like and one is a character in Skate the Infinity and that character if you know anything about that series probably know who I'm talking about um, but they're so flamboyant over the top that it's cartoony and it's very fictional and it's like it's like a Disney villain kind of and I can get behind a Disney villain because they're fun and they're over the top and they're camp and it's theater and it's I like that and that that character fits that bill even when they got some toxic traits that you're like ooh, that's not good the the flamboyant peacockness of them um, elevates it and it makes it fun in a like a like a, lo a love to loathe kind of way and I'm like cool I like that um, and then the other character is from a BL series called given and the thing about that character is that you kind of, it's the two characters that are not meant to be together. I'm going to try to find a way to say this without being spoilery, but both of the characters are very flawed 
And you find out as you go on with the story that they're not meant to be together because they both have flaws that are just not compatible. They can't gel. And so the romance between them, you're like, oh, this is toxic and it's not going to work. And it ends up not working and they go their separate ways and they both end up much happier. And I, I like the character that's toxic in that series because they leave the other person alone and they go live their own life and they go find themselves and you're able to connect with them better once they get away from that person and it helps them help themselves. And so I want that for Kyoko. She is clearly torturing herself being around Ray, but she wants to be around Ray and it's like, that's cool and all, but maybe you need to go take care of you first. And then when you're not going to like psychologically torture this kid, come back and be friends with him later. But I don't know. I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to talk about her anymore unless it's brought up in the episode, unless the show brings her forward for us to talk about and debate about. I'm not going to say much more about her until the very end of this episode when he gives the phone call. But, but yeah, you know, I will say when Ray talks about this whole 40 years conversation, <laughs> saying the, saying the term 40 years, it, it is hard to imagine how much that is. I'm 35. And the other day I was at work and I started my job full time. Like I've worked part time for years, um, but I got my full time job like six years ago and I've been working full time since then. So before then, for like five years, I was working part time. <laughs> That's not fun. Um, but anyway, I was talking to a coworker the other day and we're the same age. We've been working about the same amount of time. And they said a phrase that made me instantly like, want to lay down on the floor. <laughs> they were like, Hey, they're like, it's all right. But you know, you and I we're tier two. So we're not going to retire in our 70 until our seventies. And I was like, yeah, probably not. And they were like, yes, yeah, so you just have to work another lifetime. And I went, and it hit me in that moment that as long as I've been alive is how much longer I would have to work before I retired. And I was like, Oh, <laughs> And, I, and for a second I was like, that's, that's a long time. But then I was like, oh, that's a long time. And so it was very hard to fathom it. Cause it's like, you know, it feel, I feel like, you know, when you're zero to 10 years old, that's an age bracket and it's an age range. And then when you're 10 to 20, it's an age range. And then it feels like every decade is its own age. But the concept of a bundled amount of years, like 40 years together, doesn't seem like it makes sense because you're like, but you change so much in that amount of time. Like you would change four times over under normal circumstances. So it's so weird to me to think that, right? So bizarre. But yeah, so I'm with Ray when he says that he, you know, on this 81 square board, he's lived and died over and over again. And I feel like, you know, Ray, Ray comes at Shogi not from a place of loving it, but from a place of respect. Like he respects the game and he treats it very seriously because how could you study so much for a game unless you really treat it seriously? So I feel like in Ray's mind, oh, this person's been playing for 40 years. They must be really dedicated and they must like put their heart and soul into it. And, and they must be like diligent and studying every night. And no wonder every loss feels so hurtful to them. And, and how would I feel if I went through 40 years of just losing and losing my rank and everything? And what he comes to find out is like, no. This guy doesn't really know why he's playing it, but he's not like Nakaido. He doesn't love it. He's not exactly like Ray, where he's doing it to fulfill an obligation. He just, he plays it. He doesn't really know why, but it's like an addiction and he can't get over it. And so, and it could be that this old man is a creature of habit. He doesn't want to stop playing it. He mentions that it's an excuse for him not to do housework for his wife. So he's just, he's kind of pathetic, but in like an endearing way where he's just this little cowardly man who's like just playing shogi just because. And God, this episode needed him because walking into this episode, I'll be honest, I was dreading watching this episode today because I, I felt like, you know, Ray was going to win because it's only episode nine, y'all. <laughs> episode nine let's not get crazy um it wasn't gonna be like this big climactic thing but I figured Ray was gonna win but I didn't know like what the psychological effect would be or like if Ray was gonna think about throwing the match and then having this internal monologue where he decided not to like I didn't know how that was gonna go and so we honestly needed this little crotchety old man to like sh lift the air in back into the room and let us kind of breathe because we needed that. Like, I, I love that he kind of, he kind of calms Ray's storm for a hot second, which is really, really good. And I also like the idea that maybe, 
the winds of the storm around Ray are those winds are flared up by not only Kyoko, but by Coda, by the whole situation. And that's why the storm inside of him rages could very well be, but yeah, we needed some calming moments and this old man, like just being like, I just want to go home, but let me win somehow. Like he's not even trying. He's just going, getting luck. He doesn't even care. He's not even serious about it. And Ray's like, Really? He's, this guy's not serious? He's not betting everything on the line? He's just doing some, like, you know, good luck shrines and, and fortunes? What? He's just kind of ridiculous. And I'm assuming he got, like, the worst luck thing because then he has, like, this breakdown about it. So, yeah, Ray doesn't think he's going to show up. And then he slowly edges his way there. Now, I want to make note, Ray did not wear the uh, mint cardigan today. He wore black. Did not wear the cardigan that was from Coda. And I feel like that was very intentional. I feel he didn't wear the cardigan because it would have reminded him of Coda, which would have reminded him of Kyoko, which would have caused him to lose focus. So I feel like that was very intentional that he did not wear it because he didn't want to think about that today. Now, I love that, that Ray is trying to figure out the strategy of this old man, of if it's psychological warfare, like if it's a playing strategy. No, he's literally like flying by the seat of a, his pants, it feels like. Like he knows the moves, but he's not a good, he's not a good strategist. He's just throwing things at the wind and playing and, and hoping it works out. And I feel like a lot of his wins might have been from him confusing his enemy, confusing his opponent by saying like, and the opponent's like lulled into a false sense of security or they're kind of like do like an uno reverse where they think he's meaning something, but he means the other. Like, I feel like he has confused enough players to win because even I was like, I wanted to say he was acting, but then it was like, or is he not? And he thinks he is. It's like, he was a very confusing opponent, which for Ray, Ray is so used to very straightforward, very straightforward, serious, I'm playing to win. Here's my enthusiasm towards the game. And this is the first opponent he's faced that is maybe not as enthusiastic as the others. And even though he's played for 40 years, isn't as strategy specific. So it's a different kind of opponent for him. And I like that. Here's the thing. Ray is contemplating what he's going to be doing in 40 years. Keep in mind the ray of the past, I think, was just thinking of the past and the immediate present and what he's doing now. I don't think that until this episode, Ray has really thought about the future and what that future looks like. He, like. He's thought of the past, I think, the most, like we've talked about in previous episodes, and the present, he's kind of trying to work out what to do in the present to remedy these situations. But as far as, like, the future and what's down the road. I don't think that Ray has really thought about it. And so this moment is kind of being like, well, what is my future going to look like? Am I going to be here for 40 years? Am I going to be one challenging like the young kid? Like, it's so cool to see him actually believing there's a future with Shogi or at least questioning it, whether he believes he wants that future or not, he questions it. Now they go over some Shogi moves in this. Um, he talks about the, the bear in the cave where you, you corner the pieces in the corner there and kind of form a guard around it. And then as he's playing, he realizes that this man may, in fact, not know what he's doing. <laughs> he may not know what he's doing. He's just doing random strategies to, like, lure you away from realizing what he's doing. And then I like that the older man kind of realizes, like, that he's going to lose. And so he starts to change up his strategy and Ray is trying to figure it out. He's like, well, what is this plan? What's happening? And so then he's like, okay, well, we'll see what I do. Here I go. And he makes the move. And the old man just instantly flops. He doesn't know what to do. I like he knocks the tea. I like he's like he locks the tea over and the guy comes and gets it and it's like, what the hell? And then you see Darth Vader behind him for some reason. Why Darth Vader? I don't know. I'm like, Darth Vader's menacing. I don't know why you would show us Darth Vader for him. What? <laughs> also, can we talk about the man? There was a man sitting next to them that had a fan, right? He has a fan. It's, it's, it's collapsed in the moment, but he has a fan he could clearly use. Wh why didn't they give Nikaido and Ray little fans to use back when they were sweating their balls off, you know, in that, in that top of that rooftop from that kid's center? You can't tell me they didn't have fans to give those kids. I was like, this guy knows what's up. You distract everybody with your fan. I would totally have a fan. 
I would probably pay more attention to it than I would the Shogi pieces, which is why I would probably lose. But I think I would have fun with Shogi. Shogi would be fun. I'm not, here's the thing though. When I play chess, I like a little strategy, but I'm very much like, an, I'm either like all offensive where I'm just like balls to the walls offensive, or I am just like defense, the worst Super Bowl ever, where it's just defense. You're not cracking this impenetrable fortress and maybe an attack will happen. I don't spend a lot of time strategizing. My brother, he's a gamer and he can strategize like nobody's business. Like he gets like it all decked out. If we ever do Pokemon battles, I walk in with a team that I think is good and he's been practicing for like six months and honing their special abilities and everything to counter anything I put up against him. And I'm like, what, did, what, what can I do? So that's kind of like where we are. Um, so I'm not the best strategist. I like chess. It's fun and I can play it fairly well, but I'm sure if I was up against anybody that was remotely professional, I'd be like, Bleh. it's more recreational for me than anything else. Right. So, yeah. So then Ray is trying to figure out exactly what he's doing. And I like this idea of Ray realizing that age and experience does not equal talent. And that is a life lesson that is so, so needed to be learned when you go into adulthood. But a lot of people don't realize that. Like when you're a kid, you think that every adult has it figured out. When you're a kid, you're like, every adult knows exactly what they're doing. They have their life figured out. Who am I to judge them? Who am I to question their authority? They all have all the knowledge. And then once you actually become an adult, then you're like, wait a minute. No, they don't. <laughs> so I like Ray at 17 learning this life lesson that just because this man has been in the business for 40 years, one, doesn't mean that he's good. And two, doesn't mean that he's necessarily deserving for you to like roll over on your belly for him. Like, I feel like, you know, Kyoko was like, oh, don't you feel bad for him? He's going to retire if he loses this match. You should just throw it so he doesn't have to retire. And then, you know, because you're a nice guy. And the reality is, no, you, Ray deserves the success that he has because he's earned it. It doesn't matter that he's young. It doesn't matter that he's not been as experienced as other people. He's talented. He puts in the work. And here's the thing. The thing about Ray is that gets me is he puts in the work it's like, it's not like he's some prodigy that never practices. It's not like he's some prodigy, like you would probably see in like a shonen anime, you know, in some other battle shonen or something where Ray like was born with an IQ of 500 and like an instantly solved puzzles. No, Ray's had to study and granted he's smart. He has a natural aptitude for it, but, and you could call him a prodigy because it comes easy to him, but he still works really hard. He still studies like every other day, if not every day and practices and trains and, you know, mentally gets himself ready for a match. He doesn't just walk in as like, I'm naturally talented. I don't have to try. No. And that's what I love about Ray. And I feel like he gets judged sometimes because people don't think they don't see how hard he's working behind the scenes to be successful. And it's like, no, you earn that spot. If you're better than this old man, be better than this old man. It's not your fault that you're talented and you worked hard to get here. That's the thing. I think he realizes with the older man, the old man has not worked hard to, to get at this. It's just like you see the age and experience and you think, oh, well, they've earned this spot here. Maybe, but maybe not, right? So yeah, so Ray keeps playing him and then he's like, he's like, if you move now, you'll be in trouble, Mr. Bear. I like that Ray is almost convinced that he needs to tell the man not to make the move because he's like, you realize it's going to like be a bad move. Why would you do that? It reminds me of like playing chess with my brother when we were kids and he would make a bad move and I'd be like, I'd be like don't do that. In my head, I'd be like, don't you do that? But I'd let him make the move. <laughs> so he ends up winning and the old man like gets flustered because he can't beat him i liked it for a second ray was convinced that he was like trying to make it look difficult on purpose so that he would you know get ray flustered and do it and then we see the image of kyoko in uh in ray's head where she's like such a nice guy and he's like i don't feel like a nice guy and i'm like in this game of shogi that you're doing professionally for money to rectify the situation you don't have to be a nice guy Nobody. And what, what does that even mean being a nice guy, like forfeiting every match? Why are you even playing if you're going to do that? So it's like, no, you, you did the right thing, Ray. I do like that. They make it like a, uh, a final fantasy game where you see like level 17 Kiriyama 
and you have his HP and his magic points, and then you have uh, Matsunaga, and it's like fight, strategy, escape, and items. And he's like, I'm sorry, I'm from the pressure-free generation with no patience. And there he's like, let's go, go attack. And then you see like the little animated clouds and the thunder. And he ends up beating him. But he like throws the tiles and everything. And the, even the, the show makes a point of saying, don't ever do that. That's very rude. But he does. And then Ray is kind of baffled with how unprofessional he is. And he wants to get out of there before seeing the old man. But then he runs into him. And I like that the man instantly is like, I nearly died. Get out of here. But then he gets hungry and he's like, use your money to pay for my food. Everybody's using, everybody is using Ray's money to pay for their stuff. My thing is, they go to this restaurant, they go to a few restaurants, and he buys them alcohol. In Japan, do they let kids, do they let minors buy alcohol for older people? In the U.S., minors cannot buy alcohol for older people they're with, even if it's for them and not the minor. They still can't buy alcohol. That's like a no-go. So I was very curious how, because it's like one of those things where, I also like that we get two intros where we get the shogi cats. We'll talk about that in a second. But I didn't know if it was a thing where, like, the guy where the old man ordered and then he just gave the bill to Ray and Ray put money on the table. But I thought in Japan they paid up front. I don't know. I just, I don't know if Japan lets minors buy for non-minors. That's interesting. If you know, comment down below. <laughs> I do really love the little cat shogi intro and we finished it now. We went through the whole thing. I was hoping we would, but I didn't know how we would do that. But instead it's like the little intermission for the episode. So cute. So cute. But I would honestly, this, this little intro, Nikaido has done his job. I want to play shogi now. I want to play it now that Nikaido has shown me the cats. Super cute. So they go to, uh, they go to the restaurant. They get what looks like some kind of meat, um, like sausage or something on top of rice. And then they have the soup and they have the flare beer and the water, which is great. And I like that as, as Ray like unhinges the chopsticks, as he breaks the chopsticks, like the wind through his hair is the most dramatic thing. It makes me realize just exactly how long Ray's hair is. Ray's hair is pretty shaggy, but he's just like, and there's like the wind blowing, showing the inner, the inner storm within him, even as he's at a restaurant, right? But yeah, uh, this, this food was a uh, pretty darn expensive. If we're doing the yen to dollar conversion, uh, I know food ain't cheap, but 40, 4,700 yen was $30. For the deluxe meal, which is it's two layers. It's a uh, it's for both of them, I'm assuming. But yeah, forty seven hundred yen. That's a uh, thirty bucks for that little bowl. It's a little pricey, if it unless it was for both of them. And then they said the standard meal on bamboo was twenty one hundred yen, which was I mean I'm sure the beer was probably a bit, and that was thirteen dollars. So they like spent like forty five dollars on food. Oh, it's eel. Okay. I don't like eel. Yeah, my brother loves eel. He loves eel on sushi. Eel's too salty for me. It's too fishy. I'm like, the. But um, I like eel sauce, which is seems ironic, but I like eel sauce, just not eel. And he's like, if you want to eat beef first class, you got to start by eating first class. And he's basically telling, uh, basically telling our dear boy Ray to, like, take advantage of the fact that he has money and he's doing well and, you know, be proud of that. He's like, Coda is your foster parent. I like that he basically says he was also a prize pupil, really strong, but no personality whatsoever, which Ray has quite a lot of personality. He just hides it a lot. And Kyoka has a lot of personality. So Coda basically is like a Yumu in terms of personality. Good to know. Good to know. He's, yeah, no personality whatsoever. And he says he's got that daughter, a real darling, strong-willed with a face as beautiful as the devil. She'll become a poisonous woman. Yeah, and he's not wrong by saying that ray has been tormented by her. But here's the thing. He says all women are scary, which, you know, diffuses this situation. I like that Ray is kind, even when, even when Ray is like, what do I say to this man about Kyoka? He's like, still kind compassionate gets him a sake menu so then yeah he sees the soul of aizu on there and then he goes into this like 
big spiel about his hometown Aizu and the history of it. Now, not that I don't appreciate this history lesson. It's really cool. But he goes into a tangent for like a solid two minutes. And he says, Tokyoites say that people from Fukushima are stubborn and too serious. I like that, you know, you have geographical regions where everybody's like, well, these people are snobby and these people are country and these people are backwards. It's interesting to see how different regions kind of like have stereotypes against each other. Interesting. And he's like, well, we're just aware of our surroundings and emphasize our etiquette. He's like, they're clueless about the true, the soul of the true Fukushima. So he goes into this big, long history section, just basically justifying his entire personality traits and defending the backbone of his culture. And talking about like the third Tokugawa shogun and how he was a feudal lord with just 30,000 koku and how he sponsored the town. And here was like the feudal lord. He was a wise ruler and he was not only an administrator, he like created a pension system. He transferred the water supply, he, like did all these things and he widened the streets, did the infrastructure. He didn't rebuild the castle because he said it wasn't worth it. And I like that Ray's like, are, are you still going? <laughs> Ray's like, can we can we get some more sake over here? Like, he, this man's talking about everything forever. And he's like, he's still a child, so he's not accustomed to the behaviors of a drunk. And that part was a little sad to me because it reminds me of back when Akari was explaining how she first met him. He had been forced to drink with these adults, and he got drunk himself. So, of course, back then he wouldn't know about the behavior of drunks because... He was drunk himself at the time. And Issa and Smith are kind enough that they drink responsibly and they don't make um, our boy drink. But I like how this man here, he doesn't make Ray drink either. And so Ray gets to see firsthand what it's like to be with a drunk rambler who wants to go on about Japanese history. So yeah, he gets a souvenir. And of course, if you've ever been out with any people that are drinking, it's not just a one bar, one stop shop. Usually if you're in a busy section, they're like, let's go here. Let's go there. Let's go there. And if you're the sober person in that group, you're like, but why? <laughs> okay. And then you end up doing what Ray does. And he's like, but I don't have any money. And he's like, oh, I'll buy this next one. But then he doesn't buy it. They don't go to another bar or maybe they do. And we got, maybe they went to another bar and we saw it off screen. I don't know. But the moment they went down, the moment they were out of the city and they start going down those stairs by that river, anytime anybody's by that river, it's going to be a melancholy experience. That is the river of sadness. It's beautiful, but it is the river of sadness. Everything that's going to happen, this melancholy in March comes in like a lion, is going to happen by that damn river. Yep. And the moment he helps like that man, I, he says, his arms are so thin. Oh, our boy Ray, he looks so good there, but he's just like the arm of a man who's grasped nothing but shogi pieces for 40 years. He's like, this could be me one day. This could be me. And I wonder if he's thinking like if him being drunk is because he's, you know, lost at shogi so much that that's how he drowns his sorrows. I wonder if, if Ray is expecting that to be an answer or thinking about that which that's not always true just because you lose at something does not make you an alcoholic people can be that even when they are massively successful so i don't think we can liken that to it but he keeps going over those words in his head about him retiring i love like the van gogh shadows and the way that the animation turns i was like oh shaft just knows how to get your heartstrings right with that animation at the right time and he talks about how he's like, how could I look cool losing? And he's like, you're so young and bright and frustrating. You're like a grim reaper. Which I'm sure is how Kyoko thinks of Rei. I'm sure that's how a lot of people think of Rei. As being this like grim reaper. This prodigy who's come to like slice down the competition. And Rei's like, I don't even like Shogi. <laughs> he's like, I'm just doing this for an obligation to a man that saved my existence. So... But then he's like, when I looked at you, I thought I'd close the chapter on my journey. But then when I got there and looked at you, you were such a beautiful and young Grim Reaper that I didn't want to just, if I had to close the curtain, I couldn't ask for anyone better. And he didn't just want to like throw the match. Then he got into it. And then the more he got into it, the more he realized he didn't want to lose. So a lot of the feelings that, that, that Ray had with Nikaido start coming back for him. And I'm so glad he says this to Ray 
where he talks about the end of his legacy and he's like, even still, I don't want to lose. Like the idea that he's like, I've come this far and everyone thinks that I'm done after this point, but he's like, but I don't want to lose. I want to keep fighting. And that's kind of in a way where Ray is. Ray's like, I don't have a reason right now to win, but I don't want to lose either. I don't want to give up. Even if I don't know why I'm winning, I don't want to give up. And he asks him, do you like Shogi? And the old man's like, well, how the hell would I know? I love that after 40 years, that's the answer that he gives. He's like, when I, he's like, when you win, what does he say there? He's like, if you win, it's like the best. I'd be so happy. I'd want to shout with joy. But if I lose, it's agonizing. Like somebody trampled my innards with muddy boots. I feel tormented from everyone saying that I don't deserve to be alive. And I feel like Ray can instantly relate to that because Ray knows exactly what that feels like. Like he's had people tell him something similar and he's like, he instantly connects with this old man and knows what he's talking about. It's so good. I want to get a shot of him with like just the Van Gogh and that's it. Yeah. I love that. Just like the starry night sky. It's amazing. And he says, and yet I couldn't quit. And Ray's like, yeah. He's like this feeling. And Ray instantly knows and as he's crying. He's like, how can I even express it in words? That he doesn't want to quit. Oh, I love it so much. It's so wonderful that Ray's like, I know what you mean. He's like, it's like, it's like an addiction. He's like, you don't want to keep playing but you don't want to give it up either. And you don't really like it, but you don't really hate it. And it's, uh, I love that this man that at the beginning of the episode, we thought was going to be just like the end of Ray's esteem alongside Shogi actually is the one that renews his passion and faith in it. And is he's at least coming away from this being like, look, I don't know why I'm playing Shogi. I don't know if I like it or not but I know that this man is relatable and I want to help him not retire. And the fact that he had the balls to call Kyoko and she's like, Oh, hello. And then she's like, Oh, Ray, where are you? And I'm gonna get away from him. It's like, Oh, I figured you'd be depressed. So I thought I'd cheer you up. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Glad that you thought he'd be depressed. Good for having faith in him. And she's like, Oh, you won today. Well, it can't be helped. It's a match. And I'm like, I'm like, be happy for him. You bitch. No, what, what, why can't you give him a compliment? Like a legit compliment, not a backhanded one. Cause she's, she's reveling in the fact that she can torture him. She is smiling and reveling in it. Right. At least to our knowledge. And I love that Ray's like, bitch back off. I do love the shot of her against the green. And again, the green color with her that she's green with envy. Like she is so insecure and so envious of Ray that it's it's not a good look on her. Jealousy is not a good look on her. And then Ray being like, he Mr. Matsunaga is not going to quit. I love he steps into the light as he says it, being so empowered. He's gonna keep playing Shogi. And I love that in that moment he's so strong. And she's like, Well, what does that mean? And then she he just hangs up on her. It's like, bitch, you know. Think about it. So proud of Ray. So proud of him. Good for him. And then he helps him. He's like, let's go. I love that he calls her. And, ugh. Although, I, if I was the Mr. Matsunaga, I'd be like, wait, who said I was going to retire? <laughs> who told you that? Who said that in front of you? What's happening? And I love that Ray helps him. Like, helps him around. It's so cute. Good for him. Good for Ray. I feel so happy for him. And then he's like, he's not, he's like, would you help me convince my wife and daughter? And Ray's like, of what? He's like, I've, I've decided not to retire after all. And he's like, well, he must be worried about you. And he's like, oh, he's like, show geek players do need physical strength. And he's like, well, I don't want to quit because if I do quit, they're going to make me do housework. And I'm like, <laughs> I like that for a second you see Ray's beautiful smiling face. It looks so good. And he's like, well, I can't quit if I quit. And Ray's like, I know you won't have the same you know, aspiration and love in life anymore, will you? And he's like, no, I can't act big at home anymore. And Ray's like, what? <laughs> it's like he can't get the last, he like doesn't get the last laugh. 
oh my god it's the most amazing thing like his expression being like excuse me i'm helping you and then he's like yeah i'll have to help with chores and i love that ray offers to help him at the end he's like well i know how to do chores like i can help you do that so you can play chogi and help your family and i love that ray i love the daughters oh, oh, oh give ko a bath that part was hilarious but i love that ray's like look you need to get with your family and help them. Family members should help each other. And Ray's like, hey, you know, not saying that he's lost his family and doesn't have the opportunity now, but he's like, you should take advantage and help each other. Here's my thing. I know Ray is a patron saint. I would get as far away from Kyoko as possible. I would ditch her ass and be like, bye, get some therapy and get yourself helped. And then maybe we'll talk. But Ray's not going to be like that. Ray saying family members should help each other. I mean, partially he's saying that because he's lost his biological family and he didn't get a chance to help them more. But two, I know he's going to try to help Ayumu. He's going to try to help Kyoko. He's going to try to help put that family back together. I know he's going to do it. I'm going to watch it. I just hope it works out for him. And I just want Kyoko to get her comeuppance because she definitely needs to be knocked down a peg or two. But in any case, I really, really loved this episode. I'm glad it ended on the note that it did. I liked this old man. This old man was a much needed, after last episode being so tense and frustrating, after last episode being so tense and frustrating, I needed some levity. I needed some heartwarming goodness. And this episode delivered. So, yay. <laughs> so I'm very curious to know your thoughts down below. I hope y'all have a wonderful week. Please stay safe, take care, and yes, I'll be back next week with episode 10 of March Comes In Like a Lion. Bye!